the story was always the same for communities like yours. Water Corporation would come in, they would put a site application in, they'd put a permit application in, the community would organize, they would call a lawyer, usually an environmental lawyer, and the environmental lawyer would deliver the bad news to you, which is to say you can't stop it, in other words you can't pass an ordinance that says no water withdrawal, but what you can do with our help, and you give us a $5,000 retainer and we'll be more than happy to help you, that what you can do with our help is we'll try to stop it through the regulatory process. We'll work, the, we'll work within the regulatory process and, and try to stop it through there by making it too expensive for the corporation or taking up too much time so the corporation goes someplace else. Always about going someplace else, never about stopping it or saying no within the regulatory structure. The water corporation, which has, of course, law firms on retainer, in addition to lobbyists running around your legislature, quite a few lobbyists from what I hear running around your legislature, that these folks just wait you out in the unlikely event that there's actually a community group that stands up in the first place because most of these communities there's no community group organized at all and so these boys just come in and they pump. That's how it works. If you do something in your community using the standard tools that you have like zoning ordinances to try to stop the pumping, they sue you and they win. And they win because there's another nasty little secret. Corporations have constitutional rights. To which usually people say, well, what the hell does that mean? Corporation of Constitutional Rights. Well, guess what? Everything our ancestors fought for that we thought we drove into the Declaration of Independence about people being the source of all governing authority. Look it up. It's in your constitution. It's in Pennsylvania's constitution. It's in all our constitutions, right? Turns out that those rights were actually seized by corporations about 140 years ago. And corporations were found in the U.S. Constitution which means that they have Bill of Rights protections. They have First Amendment free speech protections, just like you or I. They have Fifth Amendment due process takings protections, which means that if you attempt to pass an ordinance that says, no, you can't drill for water here, they bring a Fifth Amendment constitutional claim against your community, contending not only does the ordinance or the decision that you've made violate their corporate constitutional rights, it also allows them to sue you for lost future profits as damages so that you're facing not only an overturning of your decision war and article ordinance, you're facing damages that you have to pay for their lawyers, i.e. attorney's costs, plus damages that the corporation has suffered as a result of you passing that ordinance. Right? It's the same stuff. Four weeks ago, lawsuit comes delivered by the sheriff to the Blaine Township Washington County Board of Supervisors. And it's the same claims. It's like the corporate lawyers, the corporate boys, they have a boilerplate on their, on their computers. They just have empty spaces and they fill in the spaces, right? Fill it in with Wells or fill it in with Blaine Township, doesn't matter. It's very easy being a corporate lawyer because you have all these buttons. You have a big chart and you just push the buttons because the boys have developed this law over the past 140 years and they just hit the buttons. It's so easy for them to do. What Barnstead did as the first community in the United States to stand up and pass a binding ordinance that said, not here. We're not going to do it here. We're not going to run rings around this regulatory system. We're not going to spend money and exhaust ourselves within a system that was not intended and never was intended to provide us a remedy. What we're going to do here is say no. And we're going to say no creatively because we're going to go after the corporate actors that are coming in. Because it's this boy, these boys who contend that five or seven or 11 people sitting on their board of directors have more rights than you. Have more rights than you, than a majority of people in the community. That five, seven, or 11 people, however many people sitting on the board of directors have more rights than you. That's what they argue in court. The unfortunate part is, for the most part, they're right, because that's how the structure of law is set up. Barnstead said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to turn the tables, right? And so the Blaine Townships of the world, and there's actually a Wells Township in Fulton County in South Central Pennsylvania, the Wells Townships of the world, that something invisible stitches all these communities together. If they were running singly, they would get crushed. But what you're beginning to see in this country is what we think is the beginning of the beginning of something big. It's a constitutional movement of some sorts to change the fundamental structure of law under which we live. That's what we think what we're seeing. Because it's not just one sticking their head up, it's a hundred. 
You know, in Pennsylvania, it's over 100 communities that have passed ordinances of this sort. People in Blaine Township, just to get to Blaine before uh, we finish up here, people in Blaine Township could have backed down. They could have said, oh my God, we've been sued, and the lawsuit's going to cost some money, and that means we have to repeal our ordinance. But they didn't. They said, we're going to move ahead. And now they're defending that ordinance. They've hired us to, re to represent them in the federal district court, and we're for the first time arguing in federal court that the right to local self-government actually is dominant to the right of the corporation to come in to rip that township apart. The corporate boys, the lawyers, the CEOs, board of directors, they laugh at you. I've been in those rooms. They laugh at you. They think it's extraordinarily funny that communities would dare to dream that they have the right to make the rules in their own communities. I've been in the rooms with the sludge, big sludge companies, and they think it's hilarious. And they get together weekly. You know, we have democracy schools. We run about 3,000 people through them. We've taught about 190 of them. These boys have democracy schools every week. And they meet by phone, and they meet in person. And they talk about how best, how best to override you. How best to perfect those tools. And in some way, those boys have been meeting for the past hundred years, and by God, they've got the thing together, stitched together pretty well at this point. Between their constitutional rights, their elimination of your local government rights under something called Dillon's Rule, which essentially says your municipality is in some ways a child to the state as a parent, and that the state has the ability to override you. All these different legal theories that have been concocted you can open the books and read them. They don't make any sense. The democracy school attendees try to make sense out of it, to which we look back and we say, it doesn't seem fair, does it? Because it's not. And there's no logic to it. The only logic to it is that those with the money make the rules. And the rules have been made to screw you uh, and for these folks to come in and do that. So they laugh at you, and I've been in those rooms. Um, and the other final piece here is that, and sometimes this is very difficult to hear, is that there's nobody out there to help you. There's nobody out there to help you. A lot of the work that we do and a lot of the work that communities across this country do is based on hope. And that hope is based that there's somebody that's going to come in to help you. Maybe it's the Sierra Club, maybe it's the legislature, maybe it's the regulatory agencies, maybe it's someone that's going to come in to actually help you. And what we've learned over the past 10 years is that there ain't nobody that's going to help you. This is a whole new road to travel. It can't be traveled just because you think it's neat and cool. It can't be traveled just because somebody tells you it's a good idea. It's got to be traveled because you've come to the conclusion yourselves that you have no other option to get what you want. Having said that, if you've come to that conclusion, we're here to provide some help. <laughs> Which means that we can use the ordinances that we've developed before. We can use the experience of these communities from across the nation. We're more than willing to help you in answering questions. A lot of this is talking to other people about why do this, because they want to know why should we engage in this ordinance, why should we take the risk, all those things. And so a lot of this is about talking to other people about what this stuff is. One of the segments that we teach in democracy school is about prior people's movements. If people had not challenged the status of the law, separate but equal would still be the law in the United States. Women would still not be entitled to vote. I mean, we can go back through all those theories that have been changed by massive movements of people from the bottom up. Um, and just to leave you with this thought, because it's one of the most damning ones that we play with in the democracy school, but corporations became persons for constitutional uh, uh, purposes before women became persons in this country. Corporations became persons under the Constitution back in 1886. Uh, women, uh, through the 19th Amendment in 1920, received the right to vote, which wasn't quite constitutional equal protection due process rights, but corporations became persons before women became persons in this country. So that's the struggle, that's the hall, and we're here to help you. As for NAFTA and GATT, one of the things we talk about in democracy school is that our U.S. Constitution's Commerce Clause, which is this relatively innocuous looking five or six words in the U.S. Constitution, which allow private corporations to sue you to overturn laws that restrict commerce. 
uh, keep in mind garbage is commerce, water is commerce, I mean, all different things have been defined as commerce as well, that that exists too. So in Blaine Township, for example, uh, the lawsuit that was filed said you're restricting interstate commerce, therefore you're violating the coal corporation's constitutional rights. That commerce clause was actually used as the model to develop NAFTA and GATT and the international trade tribunals because it's all about a higher power located furthest away from the community that's being impacted that actually has the authority to overturn through the courts and the trade tribunals uh, limitations on commerce within the community that's been passed. And so depending on the situation that you're in, it also means going up against these different structures of law as well. I mean, there's good news and everything. It's bad news as well. Uh, but it means taking on the whole enchilada because once again, if you don't, you're going to get pumped. I mean, that's, that's just the situation.